banking is not the only sector that has produced India's top women CEOs. Women have made a mark in the very competitive arena of marketing. In fact, Sangeeta Pendurkar, the head of Kellogg's in India, has had quite a run working across sectors. So when I caught up with her, I began by asking her how things have changed since she started out in 1988. When I started in the pharmaceutical industry, I was uh, uh, perhaps amongst the first few uh, management educated and uh, person with a management degree who made it to the field of marketing. Mm -hmm. But uh, fortunately, all of that has changed today. Uh, I think every single industry recognizes the need to become consumer centric and uh, they hire people in line with that agenda of winning in the marketplace by being closer to the consumer. So I think that's one common shift one has seen. Uh, so maybe 25 years back it was different. But uh, today you see whether it's the pharmaceutical industry or when I was at the bank at HSBC, uh, there was a very conscious shift to get people from the FMCG industry who understood the consumer because in banks, in fact, um, there is again another stereotype that you can't differentiate products. And uh, you probably needed people who came from the FMCG industry to break that myth and to be able to demonstrate that uh, you can actually differentiate products by putting consumer at the heart of all decision making. Mm. Tell me, let's step back to your first job. I, I know your dad was a doctor, so you all, you know, you didn't quite make it to medicine. Uh, That's and right. You, you got kind of... Um, you know, uh, interested in, in the pharmacy business and then management. How daunting was it for a woman to come in to a company uh, in the pharmaceutical space uh, in 1988? So I was the only woman marketeer until the end of my tenure in that organization. Uh, but I think I've been very fortunate uh, to have worked in organizations who even back then had practices that uh, really uh, supported uh, the need for a balanced organization and while it was uh, initially I think a bit daunting because you were the only one but it required you to adapt and feel comfortable and not feel out of place I also had colleagues who helped me settle in very well so I think a lot of it is in your mind and if you really don't see yourself as uh, being different just because you're from a different gender I think things do fall in place but you know uh, different people have different uh clubs to break into. I mean, when you look at the gender lens, it's only one aspect. Getting into Lever might not have been that easy either because many people start off at Lever, their career is at Lever. So what was the challenge over there, especially when you were also shifting, uh, you know, uh, the industry that you were in? Uh, I think that was the big challenge. So uh, having come from a completely different industry because I think the elements of marketing are different. So to be able to adapt, and that's been one of my big learnings having changed sectors that uh, you need to adapt yourself uh, based on not just the kind of marketing that you need to do, but also from a culture standpoint. So give you an example here, I think when I came in from the pharmaceutical industry, that's a more conservative uh, industry. Uh, when I came to Levers, uh, I had to change my style of working. Uh, so it's also a test of your leadership in terms of your ability to adapt to a different environment. Uh, and I think the good thing was Levers even at that time had many women in the workforce. So it wasn't that I was alone, but it was a test of my ability to quickly learn uh, the tricks of the trade specific to that industry and then be able to uh, make a success out of the assignments that I had on hand. Leaving aside the gender issue or the, the journey of a woman, uh, even though it's called women in leadership, let's talk about leadership per se. What do you think were the turning points which kind of helped crystallize your own thoughts about your own abilities? So uh, several turning points because I've had uh, several curves and bends uh, through this journey. Uh, so starting right from uh, my education. I am amongst the youngest of five siblings and my dad's a doctor. Um, I was always told that I had to become a doctor and that was my aspiration too. And I was the last hope in the family to really pursue my father's uh, career. Unfortunately, fell a tad short of my marks and didn't make it. Uh, the closest paramedical course that I could have gotten to was uh, pharmacy and that's what I chose. Uh, now, when it came time to uh, really uh, pursue the next degree, uh, I had to actually move out of my house. 
And being the youngest of the siblings and being a little overprotected, I think uh, that was a big decision for the family. So while I've had siblings uh, who've been in the teaching career, for someone to uh, really pursue a professional degree, it was a first uh, for my parents. And I think full marks to them that despite a huge generation gap, uh, they've kept pace with uh, changing time. So I think firstly, it's their support that's uh, been uh, absolutely fantastic. Uh, wouldn't have been here uh, uh, else if it wasn't for them. Uh, another turning point I'd like to talk about is uh, when I was making the move from moving from FMCG to uh, the banking industry. Uh, a lot of people and well-wishers told me that I was possibly not making the wrong decision simply because the way the function is treated in each of these mm. industries. Uh, however, um, I think what keeps me going, Mini, is really the uh, possibilities of creating something new. So I was very excited by the possibility of creating a completely new ecosystem and creating a function in a bank. Uh, it just felt like a larger canvas that I could uh, paint on. You know, uh, of course, uh, working in HSBC or in the banking sector would have been challenging for a marketer looking at or who had worked so much in FMCG. But you not only worked within India, you also took your learnings to the Middle East market, which is the, perhaps a very daunting task because it's a it's a new market and you never really worked overseas you were not one of those career globe trotters so to say so how was that experience so that was uh, yet another turning point and it was um, i think uh, the opportunity was the personal uh, the professional one in terms of going and recreating what I had done in India for about 10 other markets in the Middle East and creating something new for the entire region vis-a-vis -vis one country. So that was really the professional opportunity. It came with a personal challenge though that um, I had to move away from my family. And when it came to making that decision, uh, it wasn't an easy one. There was a lot of deliberation at home, uh, whether I should, I shouldn't. Uh, my husband is extremely supportive of my career, and I think I'm, again, very fortunate in that. And he was, in fact, the one who pushed me because uh, we realized that from my career perspective, I hadn't worked outside of India, and that gave me uh, the right international exposure uh, and a market which is not too far away from India. Mm -hmm. So it enabled me to keep coming back uh, as and when I wanted. In terms of the experience there, uh, fascinating experience, uh, a very different market. Dubai, as you would know in the Middle East, uh, is a potpourri of nationalities. So in terms of cultural diversity, it's uh, probably uh, the largest uh, cultural uh, set of people that you get in one particular market. And it's also a very transient population of people who keep moving every two to three years. Mm -hmm. So the challenges were completely different. The other piece was also managing a team. So I had a team of people uh, which had people from about uh, 20 different nationalities. So both put together, uh, I think really helped me develop as a leader. To be a marketer in a competitive marketplace like India and Sangeeta Pindurkar will tell you that each sector adds a new dimension. And while most people would raise an eyebrow at the cross-section of brands she has worked with, it all added up when she took over as the head of Kellogg in India. So um, when I look back, in hindsight, uh, I think I wouldn't change anything in my career if I, if I was given a chance to. Um, all of these moves have helped me uh, in many different ways. Uh, I think the first and foremost learning is your ability to adapt to different cultures uh, in different organizations. And I think back then there was a view that perhaps if you stuck to one industry or one organization, it helps you, but uh, I, I don't uh, subscribe to that view. I think the fact that you can adapt yourself across sectors, across organizations, across uh, uh, different challenges uh, just makes you a far more resilient individual and it makes you a far more uh, adaptable as a leader. What has been the biggest challenge however? I mean because you know it can't 
life is also about the good and the bad. So what is the challenge that you had to surmount which taught you something? There have been many challenges uh, based on the assignment, Mini, and I could talk about many challenges uh, right through the career. Uh, I think uh, the one that I talked about and which many women struggle with is the question of making the right choice when you're at crossroads. And I think my move to the Middle East was one such uh, important uh, decision, as I alluded to earlier. Uh, so while there are business challenges in the job, I think uh, as women, sometimes we really struggle and agonize over decisions uh, and uh, try and sympathize with ourselves and find a reason to not come back to work. Uh, when I was moving to Dubai, I wasn't very sure whether I wanted to move because it meant moving away from the family and from my husband. And uh, my father, being a parent, was concerned as to how I would, you know, settle in by myself. Uh, I was moving alone. Uh, my husband was one person who was very convinced about this. And uh, to the extent, I still recall that day, we were having this debate at home on making the decision. And at the end of it, uh, when my husband was trying to convince my father why it's the right thing for me, my father actually moved me into another room. And he said, I don't mean to interfere, but is everything okay between the two of you? Why is he so keen that you should move? Uh, but I think it's uh, situations like this where the support from the family helped me uh, go through a lot of these challenges of my life with, I think, uh, with a certain level of ease. So let, let, let's talk a little about the personal side also. What, what is interesting is that a lot of the, all the women that I've had on the series have always attributed a lot of their success to an environment which has made it conducive for them. You know, in your case, uh, was that also a pillar of, of, of the journey that you've taken to have this right spouse who could, you know, understand where you were coming from and be accommodative? Absolutely. I think it's so very critical, uh, not because again women are different, but women have different needs, women have a different set of responsibilities. Uh, so they need to find solutions to that. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, when I was managing this long distance relationship, we found solutions uh, whereby we could manage this long distance relationship, uh, creating a support system uh, for the husband to be looked after here at the same time, uh, fixing on schedules, finding uh, ways to communicate. Uh, so you absolutely, the right starting right from the choice that you make in terms of your spouse, uh, to the extent uh, that uh, extent of support that you create uh, in your family and in your home is so critical because then that leaves you time to focus on the business and to focus on the other big responsibility but, that but you have. Sangeeta, this is, uh, you know, I don't hear men saying this, you know. Do you think that's changing? So that's changing many to the extent that you have more working women today in the workforce. And I know of many friends and many couples where uh, today, the men themselves uh, kind of sit back and actually assess as to whose career is more important. And very often you have to make that decision that it's either the husband or the wife, one of them have to kind of compromise or uh, shall I say make a shift. Uh, but it's happening to men as well today. Uh, given your own experience and the fact that you've seen many, many women as peers, as contemporaries, as people who are working up there, what, what do you think are the two, three areas women should be very conscious of if they want to pursue a fulfilling career? So I think the, my first and foremost uh, advice to women would be that uh, dare to have a dream. It's important to think big uh, and uh, have the passion, secondly, to chase that dream. Uh, very often we can easily slip back into situations where we can give up uh, on such journeys. Right? And the good news today is that the organizations today are making a far, far higher effort to make sure they retain talent out of this pool, which is the gender pool, and uh, creating enabling situations within organizations to make sure that women actually come back. So uh, when there are milestone events, such as uh, the maternity breaks, the policies that organizations have today to ensure that women come back to work, I think is fantastic. Uh, so make sure that you make the right decisions at those milestone events and do not do not kind of slip back because today i think a lot of women uh, believe that the option of not pursuing a career exists for them a man doesn't think that way so i think it's very important for women to think of themselves as equal uh, and i think finally 
my big message would also be to the society. I think it's not just the women. So while organizations are changing, there are more women coming forth. Uh, it's also the conditioning that we provide as a society, uh, both to men and women, in terms of how we see women's role in the corporate world. There are social stigmas around this. So when a man uh, decides not to work, it is considered as a social stigma. And that doesn't happen because the man is worried about it. But when a woman decides not to work, it's not a social stigma. It's accepted. It, it, it's accepted. And that's, to make it worse, we also create stereotypes uh, whereby we tell our daughters that, you know, if you work, you, can, you are, it tantamounts to neglecting your children. Now, I think if as parents, we bring up our children equally, both boys and girls, and condition them uh, with similar opportunities and provide them similar opportunities and take away these uh, stereotypes, I think we'll be creating a far stronger economy and providing equal opportunities. Women I've spoken to in the series have said that they were in the right place at the right time and they were good at their job, so they managed to do the best they could and they actually rose. And many of them feel that they might not have started with the ambition that they started with. But for women who are watching this show, should careers be planned? Should you have an end point um, in mind when you're starting off? Does that make the journey easier? What's your own experience? I think it's absolutely critical for women to plan. Probably it's more important for women to plan their careers versus men. Um, it's important, as I said, to have a dream. And it's important to chart your milestones because uh, women do need to take the breaks, right? But at the same time, have the sense of perseverance to say that, yes, I'm going to take a break, but I'm going to come back. Mm -hmm. And it's important to figure out what the timings are for yourselves. Uh, and ensure that you don't lose sight of the destination despite the obstacles that you might come through. So I think to some extent it's probably even more important for women uh, to plan their career more meticulously. More, more important because of the fact that you have to, you know, take into cognizance a lot of the life stages that That's you will correct. go through. That's correct. That's what I call the milestone event. And uh, because you have to factor those in and those are equally important uh, events in your life. Uh, so to make sure that you're kind of doing justice to both and you're planning one and one doesn't impact the other overtly um, and you can have the best of both and it's possible to do that. So I think that's the reason if you plan it well, it's possible to, to be able to pursue a career and do justice to your family and the other accountabilities that you have. Over the last two decades, you've you worked with some of uh, the companies which are held up as examples of you know, great gender diversity because of, as multinationals, they straddle different geographies and for them, the whole diversity issue is really paramount. Uh, how have you seen this whole conversation on gender diversity change over a period of time? So over the last two decades, this has uh, evolved significantly. I think when I look back 20 years ago, um, policies to retain a part of your talent pool existed even then. Uh, so whether it was uh, providing uh, the right support when women came back from maternity, encouraging them to come back, uh, it wasn't called out as part of a diversity agenda then, but it was called out uh, as initiatives and policies to make sure that, to recognize first that there's a part of your talent pool whose needs are different and to create enabling situations to encourage them to come back to work. I think over the last 10 years, uh, there has been a greater realization about the importance of having more women on the workforce. And I think there are three clear advantages. Uh, first and foremost, there's enough written about the fact that uh, when you have more women working in an economy, those economies progress faster and better. Uh, and enough and more has been said mm -hmm. about that. 
I think the second biggest impact is that women bring a different perspective. So it's a bit like yin and yang, and I see this as complementing. I don't think any gender is uh, superior, uh, but they bring complementing skill sets. And I think uh, the third advantage is that uh, you are in a way maximizing your talent pool. So we have an equal population of men and women, but today women are underrepresented uh, to the extent of only being present uh, in 13 or 14 percent in the workforce and I think here is an opportunity to leverage that workforce and maximize your talent pool. A lot of organizations have a talent crisis so here is an opportunity for us to dip into this talent pool which can bring a diverse perspective to work. Now having said that uh, a lot of organizations today are doing a lot more so uh, I've been fortunate, as I said, all the multinationals that I've worked for had policies then. They've only gotten stronger over a period of time. So what are some of the policies that work? As a woman, what, what do you think are the policies that really worked for you? So um, the fact that uh, there were uh, flexi working hours, the fact that there were uh, enabling policies uh, in terms of um, uh, the milestone events, I think all of them have uh, helped me personally and helped uh, people in my team and my peers. Uh, and coming to Kellogg's to your uh, subsequent question, I think the definition of diversity uh, goes a little beyond gender and is true for some of the other organizations as well. So we look at diversity of nationality, uh, we look at diversity in terms of culture as well. Um, what we have uh, by way of um, a fantastic initiative, uh, especially in the US and um, a couple of other regions and geographies of Kellogg's, uh, is an initiative called uh, WOK, which is Women of Kellogg. Mm -hmm. And it is a forum which actually brings women together to uh, help uh, them foster a sense of community. And I think the way Kellogg approaches it is quite unique. Uh, it starts with establishing uh, the needs of a woman in a particular geography, of women in a particular geography, and then putting together a set of initiatives to really address those challenges that uh, women articulate. Mm -hmm. uh, so an example is uh, one of the key findings for us in the US was the need for confidence building uh, that came out of the Women of Kellogg initiative. And subsequently, the organization put in place uh, an initiative which meant uh, providing the right set of coaches, providing several interventions to ensure that we helped women and the right individuals overcome those challenges. So the mentoring is a very big uh, component of this. Absolutely. Mentoring, coaching. And uh, likewise, uh, I think if I come closer home to Asia Pacific, uh, which is a region where India belongs, uh, there's a very concerted effort and these are measurable goals uh, and targets for diversity that we all carry. Uh, so in the Asia Pacific leadership team that, uh, uh, that includes uh, people like me, the general managers and all the functional leads uh, who sit out of our Singapore office, uh, we were probably about, uh, in our leadership teams, we probably had about 5 to 10 percent women uh, not very long ago, about three years ago. Today that number has moved to 25 to 30 wow. percent. And there is a very conscious effort. So these are not quotas. So, so I was talking to Nena and she was saying, you know, the fact that it is part of the mainstream agenda means that there is constant focus on it. Absolutely. And that's what MNCs do well because this is their bread and butter because talent is where the success of a company lies. Absolutely. And if you don't engage with that on a constant basis, that is not just a top-down, um, uh, uh, you know, a slogan, but sure. really every manager sure. being able to fill this. Absolutely. Uh, that makes and it what you measure is what you get. So it is not about a quota system and I think every woman who works in the corporate world hates to think about it uh, and so does every man by the way. It's not about a quota system. I think it's about meritocracy. So everything else being equal, uh, when you have two candidates, a man and a woman, uh, your natural choice would be to hire a woman if your goal is to have a balanced workforce. Sure. So that's the way we approach it. Last question, for a mid-career woman who is facing a, a, a challenging time of whether to stay, not to stay, what to do in her career, what would your advice be? My advice would be uh, don't give up. My advice would be uh, do everything you can having invested all your time and effort in the education that you have uh, uh, secured so far. Do not let it go a waste. Uh, you are here to make a big difference uh, to your family, uh, to the larger society, to the economy. So make sure you pursue a career with the courage and conviction that uh, you are an equal to a man and find solutions to make that happen.